Well, okay, everybody, it's almost 102. And so hopefully anybody who joins us late will be able to get caught up. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started because we have quite a few things to cover. So I am Lane Bryant, and we are going to do a workshop on designing, facilitating, and assessing online discussions. I've been teaching and developing online courses in the University Studies Department for about 15 years. I also serve as an online faculty mentor for the MTSU online program, and that gives me the opportunity to work with faculty who are developing or redesigning their online courses, and that often involves lots of discussion about online discussions. Today, Kim Godwin is also monitoring the chat for us. Kim and her colleagues in MTSU Online, Tara Perrin and Karen Hine, are the instructional designers for MTSU Online. And they're an invaluable resource for all things related to online teaching and learning, especially discussions. And then I'll have my contact information at the end of our presentation. Um, and we all welcome your comments or questions at any time. Uh, we're going to record today's session and we'll send participants the video and then I'll try to do uh, an FAQ of the chat and share some resources that we're going to talk about today. So let's get started. I have several learning goals for us for today's workshop. So I hope that by the end of our session today, you're going to be able to describe how discussions could enable a community of inquiry. You can align your course discussions to your specific course learning objectives, that you'll be able to create a variety of engaging and appropriate discussion prompts, that you'll be able to communicate clear discussion expectations to students in your courses, that you can use multiple discussion facilitation strategies throughout the semester, and that you'll be able to assess students' discussion contributions uh, effectively and efficiently. I'm going to share a little bit of online learning theory today, some research based practices and several lessons that I've learned over many years of uh, experiments, both failed and successful in online teaching and learning. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. And I'd love for any of you who have some strategies that you've used that you found successful to please share them with us because I think it's uh, very helpful to find out what works well for other people. I want to start today with a discussion about the community of inquiry theoretical framework, which is commonly called the COI. Um, you may be familiar with this framework, but if not, it's a social constructivist model and it's rooted in Vygotsky's theory of learner development. And essentially it means that students will build on the knowledge that exists when they come to your class, when they arrive, um, and that they will build that knowledge with the guidance of you as their instructor and through their engagement with their classmates. And so that collaboration will enable them to reach a level of potential development that wouldn't have been possible at their level of actual development. And so online discussions can play a really integral role to that because it is the best option for collaboration in a lot of online courses. Um, the COI model focuses on three different types of presences, as they're called, in the online learning environment. The first is teaching presence, the second is cognitive presence, and the third is social presence. And when all of those three presences are combined, they create what the developers of the COI call the online educational experience. And so in a community of inquiry, students are motivated not only by their own intrinsic drive and goals, but they're also motivated by the extrinsic rewards in the group. I have personally found the COI framework really helpful in changing the way that I'm approaching my online teaching, as well as changing the way that we talk to new online instructors about online teaching and learning. Um, given all of our content is already developed on the first day of class, it can be pretty easy to shift shift into autopilot and let our courses run themselves, especially whenever you're teaching four or five sections a semester. Um, after all, we've developed all these great activities and assessments and content in our lessons, and now it's kind of time for the students to do their part, right? <laughs> Um, but the COI kind of helped me understand just how much of an impact I can have as an active and engaged instructor in creating that overall educational experience for my students. 
I also have participated in lots of asynchronous workshops and courses that have online discussions. Um, and those experiences have, have sort of helped me understand how frustrating an online course can be from the learner's perspective. And so that has helped me also kind of reframe um, and really embrace a lot of what the COI model um, has to teach us. The community of inquiry presences relate very closely to online discussion. So this table shows a little bit about how instructors and students might demonstrate some of these presences. Teaching presence is primarily obviously on the teacher. Social presence is demonstrated both by learners and teachers. And then cognitive presence is primarily on the students. So an instructor can demonstrate their teaching presence when they're creating those engaging discussion prompts that we're all hoping for, when they set clear expectations for what they want their students to do in a discussion forum, um, when they're directing or sometimes redirecting students when needed throughout the discussion period, and when they're providing timely and constructive feedback on students' contributions and their participation. And then social presence is more of an affective domain. The instructor can demonstrate his or her social presence by modeling the kind of forum etiquette that you expect from your students, by addressing students by their preferred names, which is usually their first name, and then being visible to students in an appropriate way throughout the discussion period. And then finally, instructors are looking for cognitive presence in their students. In a discussion forum, learners are ideally, we hope, going to demonstrate some cognitive presence because they're going to show us that they're constructing and confirming meaning through a sustained conversation with their peers and with the instructor or collaborating with each other or reflecting on their learning. And in a well-designed discussion, it is possible to integrate all three of these presences. And we hope that that's going to contribute to students' overall educational experience. Much of the COI research focuses on student persistence, completion, retention. Those words are sometimes used interchangeably, but meaning that students actually get to the end of the course successfully. A lot of the research also focuses on their satisfaction. And there are multiple studies that have found a correlation between the COI presences when they're displayed and those metrics. There's not as much research about how the COI presences impact actual student learning outcomes. There are a few, um, but it does seem like that's another area for some potential further research. So many of you, I'm sure, have heard of Bloom's taxonomy or Bloom's revised taxonomy, which is a widely recommended tool for aligning your course activities or assessments to your primary learning objectives in your curriculum. Instructors, you've probably heard backward design or starting with the end in mind. So determining what you want your students to know or to understand or to be able to do at the end of your course it's important to think about those things so that you can determine how discussions are gonna enable your students to actually meet those learning outcomes or those learning objectives. For the most part, objectives will be related to learning, course learning outcomes in discussion, but you also might have some other kinds of objectives like a social emotional objective, which might it sort of impact creating that welcoming course environment or community that is sort of challenging to do in the online environment. Um, introduction discussions are a common way that lots of us probably already use to develop sort of demonstrate our social presence and allow our students to demonstrate their social presence. And that's really just designed to build community and get to know each other. You might not have a specific learning outcome attached to that type of discussion, but it's still an effective way for faculty to welcome students into class. It sets the tone for your future discussions that you are gonna probably connect to a learning outcome and it helps students become more of a group. I think it's pretty analogous to a face-to-face -face class whenever the first day of class, other than a couple of maybe go-getters, students are a little bit hesitant and they don't necessarily speak up and just start engaging in a productive conversation. And so the online environment is very similar where we need to actually sort of get to know each other, 
make make sure that students understand it's a safe, welcome space for them. And that has a big effect on whether or not they're gonna feel comfortable participating in your discussions. Some learning outcomes can be pretty difficult to assess through interactive discussion. So I would recommend that if you want your students to demonstrate like the ability to create a business plan, you might not wanna use discussion for that. Just a Dropbox might be a better tool. Or if you're just looking to see if students can correctly recognize terms or identify something like parts of a cell, then a quiz or exam may be a better choice for that. So discussion's not necessarily gonna be the right activity for all kinds of learning outcomes, but it certainly can apply for just about anything that you want it to. So designing and engaging discussion prompts is a really big challenge. I feel like I've had, you know, a hundred different prompts over the years that I've taught online. Um, some work well, some don't work well, and sometimes even when you have the highest hopes for them, it just doesn't turn out like you think. But there are a lot of um, best practices and um, recommendations in online teaching and learning um, forums and uh, books that recommend some possibilities. Depending on your course level and your learning outcomes, it might be helpful to have a scaffolding type of discussion. So that is something where you're actually going to prepare your students for a more challenging topic or assignment later on in the semester. Um, the introduction post is valuable, but you also might have opportunities, especially in lower division courses, where you're introducing new terminology or concepts to students that you want students to actually apply later. And so you might think about how to create a prompt that helps you move up that Bloom's taxonomy pyramid as the semester progresses. An exploration prompt is something that's gonna require students to dive deeper into just one specific topic in your curriculum or your unit or your module, rather than trying to cover the entire chapter or unit in your discussion. So some ideas about that would be considering concepts that students struggle with. Think about your previous courses and where your students seem to actually need a little bit of extra help. And you might use a discussion forum to talk about how to address those gaps that your former students have had. Um, this is another good opportunity to ask students to go out and find examples or resources that they could share with the class. Connecting prompts are a kind of prompt that will ask students to take a concept that you're learning in your course and make a connection to one or more concepts from their other courses or from their life or experience. If you're teaching an MT Engage course, you're gonna be really familiar with this kind because this is the connection to experiences is an important part of MT Engage. Um, in my interdisciplinary research course, we require students to look back on their academic coursework to try to identify courses that they've taken that they may not have previously recognized as an interdisciplinary course, and then explain their decision making. And that kind of activity can help me determine, are they really getting these concepts and are they able to make connections or are they still fundamentally not understanding some of the base level of what we're talking about? And so I can tell in the feedback, I can give them some ideas about that before I'm going to later have them apply some of those concepts in a higher stakes assignment. An integration prompt is the kind of prompt that is going to require students to take a course topic and integrate it with learning from other courses again or their outside experience. One method that we use in our courses is that we, instead of asking students to tell me something from the reading, we'll actually give them a TED Talk video that relates to the concepts that we're talking about. And then they have to actually connect how the concepts in that 10 minute TED Talk video relate to what they read in the textbook and relate to what they're going to do in their article review assignment. And then they really seem to like these activities. I think it's a little bit of nice variety because it's one, they are actually getting to watch something. And the topics are current events. One that we use a lot is gentrification. We also use climate change. Some things that have an interdisciplinary um, sort of application and that there's a lot of current you know, research about it. It's not just going and reading a scholarly article. They can actually go out and look at some sources. Um, and some information that's more interesting maybe to them and more appropriate for a discussion post. 
a research prompt is exactly what it sounds like. It's where students are going to find some kind of resource outside your class that's related to the course topic and explain why they made that selection. Um, we use this type of prompt to reinforce some information literacy outcomes in our course. So we have students do a couple of things that we assign them, but then we also have them go out and find uh, something on their own and share it back with the group and explain how that was helpful to them and how it connects to what we're learning. And that's a really um, helpful and sort of more active discussion prompt than just something like summarizing the content that you just read in a chapter. Creating prompts require students to take information that they're learning and to make something new. Um, one activity that we've done in a class before is to develop a metaphor for a concept that we're studying. And they have to go out and find an image or an infographic that creates uh, or illustrates that metaphor. And they can create it on their own or they can source it from one of the multiple free uh, image websites that exist out on the web. And students generally really like this discussion because it enables them not only to have to describe why they chose it, so I'm able to sort of assess where their thinking is and are they uh, on target with their understanding of the concept, but they also learn from each other because no two people ever come up with the same metaphor. And so hearing them explain their decision making for their peers is something that they actually really seem to enjoy. And then many faculty have found success using discussion as a peer review activity. Students could share a draft of their work and then a classmate can provide feedback before a student submits maybe their next draft or a final assignment. We use this um, strategy in our senior capstone course where students share their research problem statement. So it's not a long writing assignment. It's just, you know, they're sharing three or four sentences uh, describing their research problem. And then their peers use the same rubric that we're gonna use to assess their research problem statement on the actual assignment, they use it to give feedback to their peers. And the benefit of this is that they can also see other people, is their other students, examples of their problem statements. And a lot of times you can do this, there's even ways to create one-on-one -on -one groups in your discussion. So D2L can auto assign students or you can do it. If you don't want everyone to see everyone's, you could actually just pair students up in one discussion for that. So there's a lot of different ways to tackle that but it's another good sort of, if you're looking away to have your students collaborate, that's a really easy one to do. And then once you've determined the kind of prompt you want to use, think about some alternatives that you might use to that standard threaded written format that students and I think instructors sort of grow weary of. Um, one example, I've used a tool called Poll Everywhere that a lot of you may have actually used in your face-to-face -face classes. Um, if I want to sort of see the bigger picture in students' responses, and I don't necessarily want to have to read through the whole thread in order to see that, that strategy can work really well if you're trying to do a muddiest point type discussion question, if you're trying to really find out, okay, what is everyone still having trouble with? And maybe I'm going to create a video or a post to address what that is. And so you can do a poll and you could do a word cloud or you could do a ranking where you can see, okay, what rises to the top? What seems to be the most problematic um, issue for students? And then, excuse me, D2L also has a video note tool, which is really a great option for introduction discussions um, or even discussions that require reflection where you don't necessarily need to see all of the citations that a student's doing where they're connecting, they're reading to another source or something like that. And video note is really pretty easy to use. Um, I create step-by-step -step instructions with annotated screenshots that I'll help students do that. They'll do their introduction post that way. And then once they've learned to do it one time, it is really easy to use again. And so then I'm able to require video discussions in later discussion forums because I already know how to use it. Um, we do that, it's really helpful on reflection type questions. So we have one activity where students, if you've heard of the six word memoir project that originally came out of, um, I think it's Smith University or Smith College, excuse me. And it's uh, the famous example is uh, Ernest Hemingway's um, for sale baby shoes never worn. And so we have students create their own six word memoir that uh, is related to some concepts that we're studying. And that, because that's generally a reflective assignment, a video post works great for that. 
Um, and so I try to intersper some threaded type discussions with some other type discussions just to keep some variety in the semester so that students don't feel like it's the same chore discussion after discussion after discussion. Um, and if you're interested in learning more how to use video note, Kim is actually going to facilitate a workshop next Tuesday on February 2nd at one o'clock. And so it's a really helpful tool. There's lots of other ways to use it. You can use it on the news feed. You can use it in lots of places, but it works really well for discussion if you have a discussion that's appropriate for that kind of um, prompt. Once you've designed all of those fabulous discussion prompts, you need to think about how you're gonna communicate what your expectations are for your students in the discussion forum. Um, it's really important to give them very specific directions. I have discovered that faculty and students have really different interpretations of the word thoughtful. And so when I first began teaching online, I would give instructions along the lines of, hey, post early and thoughtfully and respond to your peers or classmates. And I'm sure you can imagine the results. Um, everyone still posted at 11.30 p.m. on the last day. And all of the responses were sort of like, I agree, super post, love it. And um, that was pretty frustrating for me as the instructor. And I can't imagine that it was very fulfilling or instructive for them as students. Um, so for those from those failed uh, sort of experiments, I learned that it's probably best for me to communicate my expectations as specifically as I can before we start. And so in my graded discussion forum, I actually include sort of guiding principles that will apply to all discussions in the um, semester. And so that just stays up there. They can revisit it at any time. I explain what my expectations are for the format, for tone, for length, for quantity, for quality. Um, it's also clear that faculty have really different discussion practices. So I think students appreciate knowing how discussion in my online class might be different from other courses that they've taken. Um, the parameters for discussion can differ widely by curriculum and course level. So what works in my course might not be as effective in yours. Um, it does seem like lower division students would need more specific instructions, probably experienced graduate students. Um, I think that, you know, graduate students, you can have a much higher expectation um, for tone, format, um, the kinds of things that they're gonna be expected to demonstrate. Whereas undergraduate students may need a little more help. Um, in my accelerated course, I use a one week discussion period. So generally I start on Sunday and on Saturday. And in order to earn the highest score, my students are expected to post their original response to the prompt by the end of the third day. So if I've started on Sunday, by Tuesday evening, I expect to see that they've made their first attempt at answering the the original prompt. And then after that, they need to respond to two of their classmates at least by Saturday when the discussion closes. And I try to explain to them my rationale for this, that it's, you know, we're trying to have an online discussion that's not dissimilar from a face-to-face -face class and that it's not very effective in our on-ground classrooms if everybody waits to the last five minutes of class to show up to class and start talking. Um, we're not gonna accomplish a whole lot. And we're not gonna learn a whole lot from each other that way either. So I provide them a ballpark, ballpark word count and sentence and paragraph guideline for both their original response and their responses to peers. And I generally have a different original prompt than the follow-up prompt. So in the original, I might ask them to do X and then in the follow-up, I'm gonna ask them to do something a little bit different. And so I specify that in each discussion uh, topic. And then I explained to students that I'm not actually going to be going through and counting the number of words in their response, but that it would be pretty difficult for them to appropriately address all aspects of that response in a shorter discussion post. Um, I also try to make all of my discussions visible at the beginning of the semester when practical. Sometimes I might need to make a change, but for the most part, I try to have them set up by the first day of class. And one thing I think this does is it enables students to actually at least be aware of what I'm gonna expect them to do. Even if they haven't fully prepared for it, they at least have a little bit of a heads up. 
And I think that that's also very helpful whenever students might say, oh, I work on, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm not going to be able to post by then. And so I can say, but look, if you're home on Sunday before the discussion opens, you can see it and you could at least go ahead and prepare it and you can copy and paste it from Word if you need to. But it's something that um, I feel like in courses that I've taken or workshops that I've taken that last more than a couple of days, if you know that you're going to be expected to post by the second or third day, but you don't know what the question is, it does cause a little bit of anxiety, I think. And it also, if you want students to jump in early, giving them that head start is really helpful because for some of them, if you don't show them until Monday, well, they're probably not going to even start looking for at the readings or the videos or whatever materials you've provided until Monday evening. And so if, I think if you are able to do that, it does maybe encourage students to be able to be more prepared to jump in early. But regardless of the course level, I really think that you should share your discussion metrics that you're going to use to assess your students, um, both for participation, um, if you have a timeliness criteria, or for quality and quantity. Um, and you can do that either through your instructions or through a grading rubric. I also give students an example of an exemplary discussion post as a benchmark. I've actually requested permission from former students who I felt like had very good discussion responses and good replies to students. And I asked their permission. I say, can I share this anonymously for future classes? And most of the time they're very gracious and willing to let me do that. And that feels, I think, a little bit more authentic than doing one for myself because I'm sure I'm gonna use more formal language. Mine's gonna sound more stiff. And so something that a student actually wrote, I think is probably gonna give them a better idea of uh, what most students or what a successful student might post. Um, for facilitating your discussion, so once you've set your expectations and communicated those to students, now the discussion begins and we really have to decide what are we going to do. And a few years ago, I read an article that really helped me revamp my discussion facilitation strategy. In the article, Dr. Cheryl Hayek used the metaphor of a dinner party to illustrate the role of the instructor as the host of the party, or in this case, the discussion forum. And so she says that the host should be visible, but definitely not overpower the discussion to the point that students are gonna be intimidated or feel like they don't have anything further to contribute. There's lots of studies um, and scholarly research out there that shows the sometimes the more present an instructor is, it actually can have a negative effect on students' participation. But faculty who aren't there at all, that can also have a negative effect. So one strategy that I use is I do try to wait at least until that third day when I've wanted my students to show up and uh, contribute their first post. And then I'll respond to maybe one prompt, depending on the size of your class, of course, uh, respond to one or two students, um, not in saying whether or not their discussion is right or wrong, but maybe the first person who posts, I might thank them for getting the discussion started. And somebody else who maybe has raised an interesting or important point, I might make a comment on that. And then toward the end of the discussion, I might jump in and say something to another student. I might post twice in a discussion that lasts a week, maybe three times, depending on the class size. But the students are able to see that I'm there and that I'm reading their post. Um, if you are nervous about doing that, then you certainly don't have to. Another strategy would be showing up on the last day and sort of acting as a summarizer, sort of synthesize all the posts that your students made and then post so that they can see that you are reading and that you're there. Um, I've tried both ways. I tend to like to do it the way that I've landed on doing it, doing it a couple times in the week. Um, I like to be able to sort of keep up with the discussion as it's happening. Um, I also find that that helps me when I'm assessing them later um, because it, I don't have to just, I'm not reading all those discussions for the first time when I go to assess them. And that strategy works pretty well. But then the host should also be warm and inviting and address all of their guests by name. Our students are coming to our courses with really varied experiences in their online uh, learning journey. And as we would at a dinner party, we want to let them know that they're welcome and that we plan to have a really productive, enjoyable time together. 
Um, as the semester progresses, try to ensure that you're engaging with all the learners in your class in a discussion if you decide to actually jump in and participate and strive to interact with different students each week. It can be really easy for a party host to get monopolized by that one overbearing guest and sometimes online discussions can be a little bit the same. So you might have to politely excuse yourself for another conversation. But what I do, um, I tend to create an Excel spreadsheet and I'll have all the students' names and then each discussion and I'll just mark each week who I, who I interacted with that week. And then I just try to make sure that as the weeks go on, I'm not always gravitating toward the same student because sometimes you'll find usually the same student who posts early is the same student who posts early every week. So sometimes I'll have to spread that around. Um, and you may even have to reach out to students outside of the class and encourage them to jump in and participate. Um, and then large dinner parties can become unwieldy. And so it's often necessary for guests to pitch in and help the host. And the same can be true with online discussion. You can assign students roles. And some of those options are a discussion starter or a discussion motivator. You can assign somebody to actually be the facilitator. If you're having a debate, you can have someone be the devil's advocate. Um, you can assign someone to be pro-con if you're doing an issue that lends itself to a pro-con or even do the summarizer. So I mentioned that you might want to be the summarizer, but you can also assign a student to be a summarizer. And if you have enough discussions, you might be able to actually make sure that all students are able to participate in those roles. I think the summarizer, it can really be a valuable experience because having to go back and synthesize all of those students' discussions can be really helpful to their learning as well. Um, of course, that takes a little planning. And of course, there's always a time where you've assigned a student a role and the student is completely missing in action in that discussion. So those are not things that are always smooth, but they're, they're worth a try, I think. And then the roles can be rotated. And then those students can have different roles and responsibilities over the semester. It's also, if you're teaching large classes, you can also probably guess that the students aren't reading all the other students' posts in a large class. And so you might consider dividing your students into smaller groups. D2L makes that pretty easy where again, they can auto assign or you can assign them if you would like to. Several studies have found that the group sweet spot is between 10 and 15 students. So if you're teaching 25, you might wanna divide into 12 and 13 students. Um, in that way, and you may, you don't have to do that for every discussion. You could do that for different discussions. So it's possible to mix and match lots of different strategies in one semester. If your learners seem to be diverging from the topic at hand, it can also be really helpful for a uh, host to check in and redirect the conversation. I have been pretty lucky that I haven't really had any disruptive students in my courses, but you, if you're visible regularly or semi-regularly in the discussion, I also think that discourages any of that kind of behavior. Um, if, you, if you ever have a student who's disruptive, you definitely wanna catch that early so that students don't feel like there's some kind of abuse or uh, misbehavior going on that you aren't aware of. And then when it's time for your discussion to end, it's gonna be important to recognize your students' contributions and invite them back to the next one. And so discussion, maybe you might say it's more satisfying because Susan made this great point in the midpoint of our discussion, or someone asked a really great question about a concept that ended up being confusing for everybody in your class. Um, I'd like to use the D2L award tool for that too. I have an dis exemplary discussion award. And so I have D2L assign that to a student if they've earned an exemplary on my discussion rubric. And um, that's just another nice little recognition for students to see that they actually have done a good job and met your expectations. And then tracking student participation in discussion forums can be really challenging, especially in large classes. But another strategy that I use are the D2L intelligent agent tool, and that can help do some of the legwork for me. Um, I use an agent that looks for students who haven't posted an answer to that original question by the end of the third day. So the system then sends the student an email that I created ahead of time. I created this before class began. And then it emails them that email with a reminder just to jump in. Hey, I'm not sure that you realize our discussion's underway. Can't wait to hear what contributions you have for whatever our topic is that week. 
And um, I use that in the first uh, several discussions. I create a different one for each discussion so that if they miss it the first three times, they don't get the same email each time. They get a different one tailored to whatever the content is that week. Um, and then the first week, I actually send it before the discussion ends because I'm trying to train them. This is what we're going to do for the rest of the semester. So it will actually send them a message on the second day and say, hey, I don't know if you remember in this course, you need to post by the third day. So I wanted to send this message to you in time for you to actually be able to jump in and participate. And um, I have found those really helpful students. Um, you can set those up to look like they're coming directly from you and not from D2L, the system. And it is very common that students will respond to those and say, oh, thank you for the reminder. I really just forgot, or it's been a really busy week and I'm not gonna get to it until tomorrow. Um, and that's fine, that happens some weeks, but it at least lets them know, hey, I noticed, even if I didn't necessarily notice, but D2L noticed on my behalf. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about using intelligent agents, we'll do a beginner and intermediate course um, workshop on those in March. And so I welcome you to come and learn about other ways that you might use agents. Um, they can be really super helpful once you understand how to set them up. And so now that our discussion is over and we are ready to actually assess our students, how can we do that efficiently and effectively? Um, I use rubrics in my course, and while it does take some time to set it up at the beginning, it really does end up saving me quite a bit of time over the course of the term. There's a couple of types of rubrics. You could use a holistic rubric in which that's easier and quicker because it's just going to be sort of a snapshot overview of the student's achievement. But then you're going to probably still need to provide your students some detailed feedback um, in order to help them improve on the next assignment. Um, analytic rubrics are more detailed, and that means they probably take a bit longer to develop, but they also help ensure that you're grading consistently and equitably across all of your students. They also enable you to give some more specific feedback to your students and limit the need for some extensive written comments. But they also can be kind of restrictive. Sometimes I'll find I have a student that seems to be right in the middle of two measurement levels. Um, which can be sort of aggravating, but for the most part, I do find the pros greatly outweigh the cons for an analytic rubric. I typically use a rubric that has four criterion. The first is the quality of that original post that I expect, and then the next is the quality of their first response to the peer. The third criterion is the quality of their second response to a different classmate, and then the fourth is the timeliness of that original post. So students even if they don't post by Wednesday, they can still earn a reasonable score. They just don't earn as many points. So I'm using discussions for the most part as more of a formative exercise. I'm usually having students practice something that they're going to do later or um, reflect on their learning. And so there's no right or wrong answer a lot of times to the discussions. It's an opportunity for me to recognize where they might still be uh, missing some of the important things that I want them to capture. And so even if you don't post as early as I'd like, you're still going to do well as long as you really give it a good effort. But if you don't participate at all, obviously you're not gonna get a score on that. So for the first few discussions, I use this grading rubric, but then I also give them some detailed feedback explaining how to interpret that rubric that I've returned to them and then how they can improve. And then as the semester progresses, I slowly back away from giving those detailed written comments because I feel like by the third or fourth discussion, it's pretty clear that that discussion can speak for itself. And then I'll just address things that really need to be addressed. Like if a student is actually sharing some things in discussion that are really off um, or they're not actually getting the concept, I can address that privately in their feedback rather than in discussion thread. And I find then that grading discussions, especially after the first couple of weeks, is really easy, especially if I'm monitoring throughout the week and participating and jumping in a couple of times. I can probably knock out my discussion grading in about 30 minutes, no problem. And um, it's actually a, a good way for me to sort of see what students are learning, but also give them very quick turnaround and feedback on what they're, what they're doing. And I just want to share a couple of examples 
from, these are not solicited comments. So these were just comments on the anonymous student evaluation for our courses, and they were related to discussion. And so one student said, you know, they appreciated that the instructor interacted with them and facilitated class involvement, but that was different than some other online courses that they had been in. And most of that interaction takes place in the discussion forum. And so for that student, I think it did make a difference in their satisfaction in the overall online experience, as the COI developers would say. And then another student specifically mentioned one of the TED Talks from a discussion and said they actually had shared that video and talked with it with some of their family members. And so goodness, like, I don't think I've ever had a student say that they cared about discussion or liked it, but much less to say that they shared something from a discussion with someone outside of class. That seems like a triumph uh, in and of itself. And then another student specifically mentioned that metaphor exercise through the discussion that they had really felt like they enjoyed seeing other people's example of that and learning from their point of view for that particular topic. So I thought those were three specific to discussion comments from students that show that sort of creating that whole community of inquiry through discussions did seem to have an impact for these students. And again, they weren't solicited. These were just comments that they volunteered anonymously. So it seems like in that situation for that particular semester, discussions were a fairly effective um, avenue for us to meet some learning outcomes and for students to actually uh, learn something that they can take with them after class. And I know that's very fast, 45 minutes. Um, I wanted to share with you also my contact information. And then again, here's the information for Kim's video note um, workshop next week. But I'll stop sharing the presentation now. And I'd love just to hear um, questions or suggestions that you have from your own learning um, and teaching. I will also pull up the chat while we're doing that because it seems like um, Kim has been monitoring there. So does anybody want to start out? Anybody have any questions, suggestions, comments from your own teaching? I can jump in with one if no one else is going to go. <laughs> go for um, it. Uh, when we jumped in from the pandemic uh, directly into teaching online, it was a bit of a shock trying to facilitate the really healthy in-class discussion that I'd been having with students. And after the last many months now, in the beginning of this semester, I've had some really great success uh, where I've got a, a book that's very readable and enjoyable. But the thing I did with my students was I took them and said, your reading notes have to include your preparation for discussion prompts. You have to facilitate the discussion and you're gonna go. And I gave them a model as you talked about when we started. I did breakout rooms. And I said, you're the leader, you're the leader, go for it. Oh, <laughs> and, and they really got into it and, and they went, this is hard. <laughs> and so for me, it helped create value. It, in a way, it almost didn't matter what they talked about the, for the start. It's the fact that they were engaging, they were in charge, and they were just as responsible as I was for their education and experiencing of the knowledge. So that was just such a breakthrough for me and engaging the students. It was really enjoyable. So I liked everything you presented. It fit in all those things and gave me some more things to extrapolate along with. That's great. I love that idea too. I may steal that idea for my own class. I mean, that's super. And you're right. And discussions, I mean, really good discussions. I think they are a little bit hard, right? They push students a little bit. We're trying to encourage that kind of growth mindset in our students, right? And sometimes that's hard. They don't necessarily want to have a growth mindset. They want it to be easy. They want to just knock it out and be done. And so I think strategies like that are really super. I wanted to comment on Erica's question about requiring students to post first. And it's so interesting that you asked this because I just had this conversation with Tara, um, one of the instructional designers, because I actually used to do that. I would require students to post first, but now just because of my own experiences and some online learning environments, I'm not doing that anymore because most of the questions that I'm asking there, you couldn't plagiarize that kind of response. So a student is going to have to think through because they're having to relate this to a lot of times their own personal experience. And so I'm not nervous about whether or not academic integrity is going to be jeopardized. Um, I think that for me teaching an undergraduate level course, 
most of the time it's actually more helpful for the students to see someone has already jumped in because when I require them to post first, almost all of them show up late on that third day. But when I let them post whenever, they will sort of trickle in. And I understand that. I mean, heck, I have anxiety myself about being the first person to jump in. I'm a little bit nervous. Am I going to have it right? Um, and so I'm actually not doing that anymore. But depending on your learning outcome, if you're having them demonstrate something that is really more of a high stakes, they actually need to think that through themselves, that might be a good option for you. But I'm actually trying it without that. And I'm liking that so far. So. Um, I'd be interested to hear what Karen and Kim have to say about it, but. I'm going to say, uh, just to pipe in a little on that, I think it really does depend on what the discussion is about and what you are trying, <clears throat> excuse me, to measure, because I do both. It depends on the discussion and what I'm looking for, uh, because I, <clears throat> excuse me, because I want some of that variety. You know, sometimes when, when we read something, we get in that mindset of, oh, that's the thing that I see and that's the thing that I'm going to answer. So um, speaking, I guess, specifically to an example that she mentioned earlier with the metaphor, um, if the first person does, uh, if the first one is a smoothie and then the very next person uses food um, and everybody sees those first two or three all be about food related, uh, that tends to without intention, limit our own creativity and all of our posts end up being about food. So on some of them, I do limit because I want it, I want people to be more creative. On others, I'm totally fine with everybody seeing everybody's because they are so individual and, and they're applying it to their own life and their own experience. So it, for me, it kind of depends on what the activity is or what I'm looking for. Erica, does that help at all? Yeah, that really, I think, helps me make the decision whether to use that function or not. So yeah, those were really great examples. Thank you. And Laura, I see your question about rubrics. And so I am not sure the answer. So let's ask Karen and Kim, is there a way that you could actually assess students on just their original post first and get that out of the way before you actually assess them on the second part in one rubric, or would you have to use two rubrics? You would need to use two rubrics because it wouldn't, you could do it and save it as draft in one rubric. So you could go through, but the student wouldn't see it until it was published. Um, and so you'd have to go in and update it. You would need to have two, two sets of criterion. So that can be in the same rubric, but it's two sets of criterion. So um, I guess we probably need to talk at some point later in months from now about having another rubrics presentation. <laughs> This happens every time. <laughs> but yeah, Laura, if you have specific questions, I'll definitely help you with that. Uh, or Karen can, either one. I have a question about uh, breakup rooms. Uh, David mentioned this. How many students yes. have to put it in, in one break room? So you can actually break out rooms into any kind of uh, configuration that you would like. You can say to D2L, please just divide my class evenly into three groups or divide my class into four groups. And then in your discussion settings, you can actually go in and restrict the topic to certain groups. Um, Kim probably has much more specific directions than I do, but it's pretty easy. And you can use the same groups for the whole semester. You could use different groups for different discussions. Um, I welcome anybody else who uses discussion groupings to jump in if you have some good suggestions or Kim and Karen. For my use of it, I had 11 students in this, this class. So I did an auto breakout in, you know, five and five ish. And uh, that that's what I had. But it, certainly if I needed pairing up, you know, think pair share stuff like that, I can always do duples and uh, go through there. But Zoom's gotten better over the months and making it much, much easier. Previously, it was quite a laborious task to get everything isolated. So I just uh, added the how to do groups in D2L to the chat. It's the uh, presentation that we did it's whenever we did it, um, about how to create groups in D2L and setting up groups. It's the, the different types of groups that there are and how you would set those up. Because there's some that are self-enrolled, there are some that you manually enroll, there's some that are auto-enroll. Um, you can determine whether or not you set it up by the number of groups or the number of people. Um, and 
groups in D2L, it, it takes a little bit to kind of figure out the first time, but we tried to walk you through like step by step exactly how to do it. Uh, but you can really vary it based on your needs and you can set up as many different types of groups in a given semester that you need. Uh, so if you want some to be um, larger discussion boards that are 10 or 15 people, and then you want some that are three or four people for group projects, or you want some that are topic related, or I mean, you can create as many as you want, and then you would assign them specifically to uh, drop boxes or uh, discussions as applied to the needs of your class. Uh, but that video should help you with that. And then if you have questions, you can always reach out to uh, Tara, Karen, or myself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'll share when we send out the video, I'll send also for Sheila and the LT and ITC a little um, sort of an online resources that has a lot of resources that I have found really helpful as I have worked through this. So lots of teaching and learning centers from other universities as well as our own. I would also recommend the LT and ITC enables us to um, have access to the teaching professor newsletter, which I have found really helpful. That article that I found about the dinner party metaphor, that was actually through one of those newsletters. And they have always multiple times a month, something about online discussions. And I found lots of really helpful resources there too. Um, and so, but I'll share that. And then I'm happy to share um, my grading rubric just as an example. And then I'll share some COI um, research uh, with you just in case you're interested in that. I feel like my OneNote uh, library these days is like half COI. So I'm happy to share some of those. There's a lot of research about that. That's pretty interesting. Anybody have other thoughts or questions? We still have a few minutes before our time is up. So when um, we set when you set up separate groups in a discussion, the students are. I just want to make sure the students are able to then just respond to that certain group of students. That's right. Mm -hmm. that, that's not a working group like during a, a, a synchronous class. They can go right. In. Okay. That's right. right. It's an asynchronous group. And so they can actually, you can restrict it so that they can only see that. And that can work really well also for those peer reviewing type activities if you just want groups of two. Mm -hmm. And then you can even have them do groups of two and then come back to a larger group for a, a different discussion. So it's really flexible. Okay, thank you. Sure. And we can, Jessica, we can share some examples of holistic and analytic rubrics in that, um, in that resource that I'll share with you. There are several examples of different kinds of rubrics that you can use. So we're happy to share those too. Okay, well, if nobody else has any questions, I'm happy to hang around if somebody has a question that you don't wanna ask in front of the whole group, but I, I'll be here until two o'clock. Um, let's see, it does look like a few more things have come through. Um, okay, all right. Well, if anybody else has other questions, I'll hang around or please email me, email the instructional designers, I'm happy. And if you have great ideas to share, just like David did, would love to hear them um, because it's so easy to just uh, not reinvent the wheel and use something that's worked well for somebody else. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your time. I just have one question. Um, sure. I'm experimenting with um, with using Microsoft Teams. Mm -hmm. Would you suggest using that in conjunction with D2L or do you think that's a problem? That's so interesting that you say that because I've been thinking about that same thing because I like sort of that collaboration space in teams. And so I've been sort of interested. I haven't tried it out yet. So this is the first semester that I'm kind of using teams for a couple of other work groups um, for like committees. And so I don't know, I'm curious if Kim um, or Sheila, if any of you guys use teams in that way or Janet, I mean, Jessica, any of you all who are staying, have y'all tried teams that way? I actually have been using Teams, not the actual team function, because I think it's too much of a leap right now to teach students about the team function, but I use the chat function. So what I've done since last term is I've um, taught students how to access Teams, 
and how to use the chat function as a way to contact me that's an alternative to email. I just tell them, hey, I have Teams up on my computer every time I'm working. And if you just have a quick question, it's actually much more, it's faster and more informal than using email. And some students have really taken to that. So I put it out there as an option. I don't require them to use it because I don't want, if students don't want to learn another platform, I don't want to force them to. But I see it 